During the inaugural boot camp week in Las Vegas for cohort number one, Jonathan Dotan provided his view on the future of Web3 storage as relates to legal issues. However, this presentation is supplementary to that for all participants to cover the general legal aspects of storing enterprise data. As with other modules, more detailed information is documented and linked through the Filecoin website of our learning management system. So first of all, we're going to cover some of the basic aspects of our standard contracts. Uh, things like service level agreements, indemnification, pricing, term of contract, privacy, warranties. Unlike the default model of storing data on the Filecoin network, enterprise class customers and clients expect a formal written contract between the client and the storage provider. Now, contracts are legal agreements between two parties or more. Legally binding contracts must have essential elements in order to be enforced in court. Some contracts that are missing one or two of these essentials will still hold up in court, but it is best to have all of them covered. Get professional advice from a contract review attorney when possible. Contract is made basically anytime one entity offers something to another and this offer is accepted. Your contract with the client or your customers should include provisions about the type of data stored and its legality. Data that is legal in one jurisdiction may not be considered legal in another. One example might be data with a protected copyright. Even if a customer believes the data is not illegal, there may be cases where a copyright holder files a claim against your customer, which then compels you to delete the data. In some cases, you may be in a position where the complainant is in one legal jurisdiction and the customer is in another legal jurisdiction and where you store the data and where you maintain your business is in a third jurisdiction. You're going to need a professional legal advice to sort this out. It is not simply a matter of being able to delete the data at a customer's request. Uh, there are third parties out there such as Murmuration Labs. Uh, they offer tools for Filecoin that can reduce legal liability. While these regulatory issues need to be considered, blockchain linked data storage is considered a way to protect copyright for content creators and publishers. We see that in the world of NFTs, and some of the cases that we mentioned earlier. When entering into a contractual relationship with an enterprise customer, there is an expectation of a service level agreement, an SLA. A service level agreement is defined as a legally binding contract between the service provider and one or more of the clients that lays down specific terms and agreements governing the duration of the service engagement. That is, when the client is paying for said services and the provider is obligated to deliver them. When we look at SLAs, there are really five key SLA metrics that are often looked for. These metrics are availability and uptime, uh, response timelines, mean time to resolution, defect or error rate, and first time resolution of issues. Now, I'll refer you for a detailed uh, look at this to our Michael Fair, whose present presentation on marketing and acquiring customers uh, gives you a, a broader scope. But in a nutshell, we want to look at the uh, client broker models that enterprise service providers may be using. As an enterprise storage provider, there are going to be cases where the enterprise storage provider deals directly with an enterprise customer seeking to have their data stored. This is the most direct relationship between an enterprise storage provider and an owner of the data. There are also cases where an enterprise storage provider will deal with a broker that holds a relationship with the data owner. Some examples of this include Estuary and Textile.io's BidBot. In these cases, the enterprise storage provider needs to fully understand the relationship and expectations of those brokers whether in terms of data legality, SLAs, and any negotiated requirements, such as the requirement to host Filecoin storage in commercial data centers. Other broker models may be a hybrid, such as a managed service provider that provides hosting services, but the enterprise storage provider uh, provides compute services, such as sealing workers. Uh, 
The key here is to understand the enterprise storage provider obligations and expectations with their broker. Another thing we hear about in the enterprise uh, storage provider world and having enterprise uh, customers is the need for audit capabilities. The most common one today is called a SOC 2, our Service Organization Control version 2 or level 2. Service providers to enterprises are expected to provide audit documentation of process controls. The SOC 2 standard was built upon the older SAS 70 framework by the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board. It has since been updated to terms such as ISAE 3402 and then SSAE 16, or now commonly known as SOC 2. Uh, this is also known as systems and organizational controls. Most enterprises value the SOC 2 Type 2 annual report, which looks at both design controls, or I should say controls design, as well as effectiveness based on sampling control evidence throughout the year. It is important to note that SOC 2 is a controls framework and is not a security certification. However, as the security trust service principle is mandatory in any SOC 2, there is an expectation of an underlying security control framework, such as annual pe penetration testing, and ideally a security framework such as ISO 27001, which is an international standard, or the NIST cybersecurity framework and CIS critical security controls. These are federal or US-based. Organizations that expect to have cybersecurity insurance will also find that insurance carriers expect some of these security controls to be in place such as the widespread use within your, or your organization of multi-factor authentication, MFA, and antivirus protection that includes endpoint detection and response, or EDR, capabilities. So SOC 2 is the abbreviation for System and Organization Control, or sometimes you'll hear it Service Organization Control, uh, type 2. It's an auditing procedure designed to ensure that a third party service providers are securely managing data to protect the privacy and the interests of their client. SOC 2 is based on the American Institute for Certified Public Accountants Trust Services Criteria and focuses on system level controls of the organization. This specifies three types of reporting. SOC 1, which is really a financial report. SOC 2, which is what we're talking about here, uh, deals with protection and privacy of data based on the trust services criteria. And then there's SOC 3, which deals with the same information as SOC 2 report, but it's intended for a general audience and can be published publicly. They are shorter and do not include the same details as SOC 2. Uh, most enterprises will require the SOC 2 because it has more details. It's also considered confidential and often requires a uh, non-disclosure agreement to be signed before uh, a client can download one, given the nature of the sensitive information that's contained in there. SOC 2 compliance plays an important role in demonstrating your company's commitment to securing customers' data by demonstrating how your vendor management programs, your regulatory oversight, internal governance, and risk management policies and practices meet the security availability, processing integrity, confidentiality, and or privacy controls criteria. SOC 2 requires your organization have security policies and procedures in place and to ensure that they are followed by everyone. Your policies and procedures form the basis of the review, which will be carried out by independent auditors. However, it is important to note that SOC 2 is fundamentally a reporting framework and not a security framework. SOC 2 demands reports on your policies and procedures that are established to give you effective control over your infrastructure, but does not dictate what those controls should be or how they ought to be implemented. The policies and procedures should cover the controls grouped into the following five categories called trust service principles. Number one is security. 
Now, security is the foundational principle of your SOC 2 audit. It refers to the protection of your system against unauthorized access. It's a mandatory principle. You cannot have a SOC 2 without having the security principle. All the rest of these are optional and generally cost additional money to have performed. The second principle is availability. Principle of availability assure, requires that you ensure your system and data will be available to the customer as stipulated in your contract or SLAs. The third one is processing integrity. The processing integrity principle requires that you protect your system and data against unauthorized changes. Your system must ensure that data processing is complete, valid, accurate, timely, and authorized. The fourth principle is confidentiality. This requires you to ensure the protection of sensitive data from unauthorized disclosure. And finally, privacy. This is the newest principle, uh, one that is still uh, being worked out within the audit community, but the basic principles are in place for this uh, trust principle. Uh, it deals with how your system collects, retains, discloses, and disposes of personal information, and whether it conforms to your privacy pol policy as well as the uh, AICPA's generally accepted privacy principles. This was all rather long-winded. In simple terms, here's what you are really required to do to become SOC 2 Type 2 compliant. First, establish data management policies and procedures based on five trust service principles. Second, demonstrate that these policies are applied and followed religiously by everyone. And three, demonstrate control over the systems and operations that are in scope. Another aspect of uh, regulatory and legal control has to do with the right to be forgotten. Uh, we see the European Union established in their privacy laws a right to be forgotten. This was in order to give European Union citizens and residents the right to request the removal of their personal online data. In other nations, including the US, similar regulations are being considered and numerous lawsuits have been upheld, have upheld that require erasure of personal data. As an enterprise storage provider, you may be storing with or without your knowledge personal information that may be subject to these regulations. Again, this is something that you're going to need an attorney for because the rules are complex and often you won't know who that end user is that is requiring the right to be forgotten. You simply need to know that there's this aspect of uh, regulation that's uh, becoming more and more prominent. And finally, the next module after this is called Filecoin Ecosystems. Thank you.